You're watching JCT TV. This is Bible study for the 21st century. So friends, uh, if you watch JCT, and by the way, you can watch it not only on this network, but you can also watch it online at jimcannellontoday.com. Why not? But if you've been watching it all in the last little while, you've met Mark Vandervenen, who is a psychotherapist. He's also a marriage and family therapist. He's the executive director of the Shalom Mental Health Network. Remarkable guy, tremendous faith, and tremendous insights into some of the mental problems we're facing in our, in our time. Back with him right after this. Jim Kennel on Today is a program dedicated to the teaching of the good news of Jesus Christ. This all through the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. JCT also brings to you encouraging testimonies and stories from Christian leaders all over the globe. If this program has added value to your life, would you please consider becoming a partner? To do so, simply contact us by phone, mail, or online. Mark Vandervenen is my guest, as I said off the top. Uh, this is our third interview this month. Uh, he's terrific. Executive Director of the Shalom Mental Health Network, shalomnetwork.org. Check it out. He's a psychotherapist. He's also a marriage and family therapist. We've been having some great conversations this month. So, Mark. Jim. <laughs> this has happened to you a lot, I know, and it's happened to me as a pastor, too. Uh, could, could be a man, could be a woman could be old, could be young, could be middle-aged, they come in and they just unload on you and they tell you about the sexual abuse they suffered as a child. Right. I have been absolutely blown away by the burdens that people carry from sexual abuse, yeah. sometimes into their 80s and 90s. Absolutely. What is it about sexual abuse that has such a lingering impact? There's something about it being such a violation like it crosses a boundary. And it's such a violation that it's extremely challenging to put that boundary back because it's been violated, it's been ripped open, it's been ripped apart, uh, not not because of something you've done. Yeah. So you're also dealing with that. How do I understand this? You know, the world, I thought the world was a safe place and now it's not. And, and often it's it's at, at a stage in a, in a person's life when they're a child and they're right. powerless, right? Exactly. And in many cases, the perpetrator is someone who should be trusted. Right. Uh, absolutely. They're uh, usually a, a it's, father, an uncle, yes. uh, a loved neighbor, uh, an older brother, uh, you know, whatever. You know, one of the things uh, that has been found in the research is um, often um, it's so the abuse is one thing. Mm. It's often the response of the adults to the abuse that has is, is the, be, be, the biggest predictor of whether the abuse will have long-term impacts. What do you mean by this? So um, if the adults somehow collude with it a little bit, if they're not oh, you mean the, condemning the, the it. The other adults in that yes, child's like, life. Like a parent, like a te parents, teachers, pastors, right? Okay. If they somehow, if they don't condemn the act, if they don't say this is absolutely wrong what has been done to you right. and come out fully in support, then it's like a, it's like a second layer of the abuse because first I've been abused. That mm. does not fit my picture of the world. Right. But now it's looking like the whole world is colluding with my violation. Mm. And then the whole world becomes an unsafe place. And that's an extremely difficult thing to come back from. Mm. Yeah. But if as adults we say this is wrong, you're not, you did not deserve this, you had no power, 
and there's some action with respect to the perpetrator, then some of your confidence in the safety of the world can get a little bit restored. I was talking to a very successful pastor one time, a uh, very big church and a, a very healthy family of, of a number of children. And uh, he told me that when he was a child, his parents used to um, uh, give billets to visiting evangelists. Right. And uh, back in those naive days, often uh, the evangelists would sleep in the same bed as the child. Right. Because there was no extra room. Right. 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 And he was abused several times by this traveling evangelist. Yeah. And, and he said, you know, frankly, it was pleasurable. Right. Uh, and he said, I was imprinted with pleasure. Right. He says, every day of my life since, yeah. I've had to deal with this. Absolutely right. He finds, uh, you know, attractions there that he doesn't want to be there, but they're there because of this imprint. Exactly. Is, w w what about this pleasure imprint? I mean, is that a, a Th that's real? Factor? That's real. And it's it, it's a big part of the confusion that comes with the abuse because yeah. I've been tremendously violated. Yeah. But there was also pleasure in yeah. it. There's an intimacy I've never experienced before. Right. And so how do you sort that out? And and that imprinting is a good word for it because yeah. it affects your brain stuff. Yeah. Uh, and and it's physiological, uh, and then so how do you deal with those impulses? Now, as a psychotherapist, yeah. it, it, when you're dealing with, with something like this, is this something you have to work at incrementally? Uh, is there a magic bullet, or or or, or do you just um, basically hope for coping methodologies? There's there's no magic bullet, yeah. and it's not a short term thing, yeah. um, but you can hope for more than just coping, yeah. um, because and often. Um, it can be especially helpful if uh, the person is an adult and in a pretty decent relationship mm -hmm. with a husband, partner, wife, whatever. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, because then together uh, they can work on this stuff and build a different kind of relationship with the partner being very understanding of what's going on. Uh, but the experience, the, the experience of intimacy can be changed for the person who's had the abuse. And um, and that intimacy can be beautiful and powerful and have as much and more meaning than the abuse did. I remember as a kid, you know, hearing some fairly straightforward comment about dealing with issues. Yeah. And saying, well, just come to Jesus and all things will pass yeah. away and all things will become new. It took me a while until I got into college, actually, in seminary to realize that there's a Greek continuous present there. All things are becoming uh, new. <laughs> Very all nice. All things are becoming new. Very nice. Uh, the, uh, yeah. he healing very rarely is, is a... Absolutely. Is a, it can happen that way. Yes. But generally speaking, the way the Lord heals us is incrementally, right? Absolutely. And it's and it can be over a lifetime. Yeah. You know, time time is different for God than for yeah. us. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think God, you know, brings it to us in, in doses, in measures that we can handle. Yeah. Part of his love for us. So this is another very interesting, I think almost universal issue. You grew up in a home where you're not abused, but you're not really loved. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, you, you know, you're cared for, you're, you're fed, you're clothed, yeah. uh, you're yeah. educated. Yeah. Uh, but there's no real sense of love from the parents and no real sense of the uh, special intimacy that comes from parent-child relationships. Yeah. You find yourself now as a young adult, early adulthood, whatever, yeah. and you know, you're looking to marry somebody, looking to love somebody, yeah. you don't know how. Right, absolutely. Is love something that has to be learned? It is something that has to be learned. We, it's to be practiced. Love is like a muscle, more than a feeling. Yeah. You have to use it, you have to work out, you have to be engaged with doing love hmm. in order to learn love. Hmm. Uh, and so in a situation like that, hopefully there's enough awareness to know where you've come from and maybe you can get linked up with a partner who can support you in learning that stuff. And maybe you get a little bit of therapy to help you along the way. Yeah. You it's know, more you, of a muscle than a feeling. Yeah, love, yeah. Right? I, yeah, I, yeah. As, as a preacher, you know, and a theologian, I've talked of love as a decision. Yeah, it's yeah. Some, it's something you decide to do. And love is what you do when you don't feel like it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. In our secular culture, yeah. of course, love is totally a feeling. Absolutely. And so you're in love, you're out of love, you know, and, and you listen to country and western lyrics, and it's always about love lost. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. Heartbreak <laughs> again. You know, yeah, yeah, done me wrong, yeah. you know. It took a fine time to leave me, Lucille. Yeah, with yeah, yeah, yeah. Five hungry children. And yeah. All. You know, I, uh, I've often said that f for me personally, I learned an awful lot about love by watching my dad love my mother. Yeah. Right. 
and, and you know, boy, he loved her. Right. She loved him. Right. And he made it clear. I remember he, 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 I would hear him three, four, five times a day telling my wife or uh, my, my mom, yeah. hey, Cheryl, you look terrific. What, uh -huh. what a great meal. Hey, I love you. You're I, you're the most beautiful woman I've ever met. This kind of stuff. I'd beautiful. Hear, I'd hear him saying this to yeah, my mom. That's beautiful. And I just assumed that that's how you right how you do it. Well, you know what that did too. It gave you a language. Yeah. To express love yourself, right? Right. Right. Yeah. Kath and I've been married for forty nine years. Yeah. <laughs> Feels like forty nine days. No kidding. It's just awesome. <laughs> But it's the I, year I, of Jubilee for you. Yeah, that's yeah. right. The year of Jubilee. <laughs> yeah, this is the year I should get a break. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, I just, I've practiced with her what my dad practiced with my mom. And boy, yeah. not only does it create a positive home atmosphere, but it comes back to you. Yeah, exactly. It's almost like investing in a, in a beautiful garden. It's exactly. More and more beautiful. So what about the person who's known no beauty in their life? Not just no love, but no beauty. Life has been a stress, a total, right. total stress. It's been adversarial the whole way. Right. The fact that they're still on their right. two feet almost makes them heroic in my view. Right. Uh, how, how, does, how does someone who's had nothing but adversity shift gears? You know, I am amazed by the resilience of people. I've, I've worked in many situations of incredible, you know, multi-generational poverty, multi-generational abuse, uh, working with their kids, and I go into their home, I've done a lot of work in people's homes, and I come out of there and I come out thinking, how are you not doing way worse than you are, yeah. right? Yeah. If it was me, I think I'd be in far worse shape. Yeah. There is a powerful impulse in people to heal, to get better. From my faith perspective, that's an impulse from God. That's, that's the active presence of Jesus in our life. Um, and, and it's powerful. And so what I think we need to do as communities, as churches, as professionals, is find ways to tap into that impulse and support it uh, in ways that are meaningful for that person specifically. You know, it's not a canned approach that applies to everyone, but it's specific to that person and their journey. You know, when you talk about resilience, what I, what's occurring to me as you speak about it, is that this is evidence of the image of God. Absolutely. God has created us in his image. And even yeah. though our life has been nothing but hell, yeah. there is still, if you will, that smoking flax, that bruised reed, that's, yeah. there's still a little bit of life in there. Right. And all you need is a little bit of breath of the spirit and right. suddenly, poof, right. whole new new life begins to, 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 right. to, to spring forth. There's real hope in that. And often it takes someone who believes in us at our darkest moment. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, next next interview, which will be our last for this month, I can't believe it. I want to <laughs> I want to talk to uh, to Mark not just about the skills of psychotherapy, but also the impact and the power of prayer and faith. You know, friends, you, you listen to this, and maybe this is resonating with you. Uh, I, this is not a simplistic thing for me by no stretch. The Bible says we should cast all our care upon Him, for He cares for us. This doesn't mean you have a sudden instantaneous healing. What it means is you have someone to bear your burden. You have someone to whom you can express your heart. And the Bible makes it very clear that the Lord hears us. He hears us and he answers prayer. He may not answer it the way we want him to answer it, but the fact of the matter is he does. And I would just encourage you, you know, if uh, you're going through the slew of despond, as Pilgrim's Progress puts it, to understand that you haven't hit the bottom yet. Nor will you, if you put your trust in the Lord. Slowly, surely, and I do mean surely, He will, as the old hymn used to say, pick me up out of the miry clay, set my feet on a rock to stay. There is hope in Christ, there really is. And I, of course, I'm trying to share that with you every show as we go through the Gospels, and we'll be doing that right after this break.
Friends, as you know, Jim Cantillon has been offering Cantillon's casual commentary as a Bible study supplement to his ongoing exposition of St. Matthew's Gospel on JCT TV. He's excited to offer Volume 4, which completes the Matthew study. The Transfiguration, Triumphal Entry, Crucifixion, and Resurrection of Jesus Christ are all covered in this volume. Like the first three volumes, it's concise, captivating, and casual. To order your copy, you can call, write, or go online. Request Cantillon's Casual Commentary Volume 4, and for a gift in any amount, it will be sent to you. When you place your order, also consider becoming a monthly partner. Remember, your gifts help us build this ministry. You know, friends, uh, a lot of you are watching, you know, for the first time or you just found our program in the last little while. I just want you to know that um, as a long term pastor and uh, broadcaster as well, uh, I have learned a few things. And one of the things I've learned that is of great value to me, at least I hope and to you as well, is that there's no substitute for spending time in the Gospels of Jesus Christ. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Uh, Without the Gospels, where would we be? Uh, thank God for Paul, thank God for Peter, thank God for John and all the others who have contributed to what we call the New Testament. But ultimately, it's all about Jesus. Uh, Paul himself said, I, I, I sought to do nothing among you except preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And so what I do on this program is I just focus on the Gospels. That's all I'll do for as long as the Lord gives me breath and we have a television program and an audience. I'll let others deal with Pauline theology and with end time speculation and all that kind of th thing. I'm just going to deal with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So that's one thing, one value I've learned. Another value I've learned over the years of pastoring is that there's no substitute for caring for the poor, and, and especially the poorest of the poor, orphans and widows. And so 20 years ago, my wife and I established a ministry. We now call it WOW, Working for Orphans and Widows, and you see it advertised on the program. Uh, we are working with thousands of orphans and widows, have been doing now for 20 years in Sub-Saharan Africa and now also India that have been impacted by HIV and AIDS who are very much at risk. Many of them are households where children are raising themselves. And I say households, they're mud huts with a grass roof. And what we do, we specialize in home-based care. That is, we care for those who are dying, for those who are at risk of dying. And we deal with all the issues that deal with food security, with health issues, with uh, crisis intervention, and it's all done through a strong volunteer base that has been recruited among hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of churches that we have um, mobilized over the years to caring for orphans and widows in their extended communities. So JCT and WOW are one and the same. And uh, when you support JCT, you're supporting WOW. When you support WOW, you're supporting JCT. J uh, JCT is the official voice of WOW, but we're also very committed to making sure that our biblical foundation is solid. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, okay? All right, so we're gonna pick it up here. Where am I? I think, I think I'm in verse 50, I'll get there. Yeah. Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit, that's verse 50. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, the earth quaked, the rocks were split. The graves were opened. Many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Now, this is fascinating. This is really interesting. First of all, the temple veil torn in two. Uh, if you have never uh, Googled, you know, the, the temple, you should do so. Or pick up a book or two that has a pictorial kind of representation of the temple and what it looked like, not only in terms of its exterior, but also its inter interior layout. You had the holy place, and then you had the holy of holies, or the most holy place, right in the center of the temple. The most holy place was a place where only the high priest in, went in once a year to atone for the sins of the nation. It was a very, 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 very holy place. Separating the 
Holy of Holies from the holy place was not a wall, but a curtain. And it was a very thick curtain. Uh, you can read about it. It may have been six to eight inches thick, really thick. I mean, stronger than, than steel, uh, intricately woven, probably beautifully colored and uh, priceless, all right? There's no way that that thing would ever be destroyed. Jesus dies. At the moment that he dies, this veil, as it's called, was torn in two from top to bottom. It would take a supernatural strength to do that, and of course that's exactly what happened. Also, there was an earthquake, and the rocks were split, and graves were opened. Now, I, I'm trying to imagine this in my, mind, my mind's eye because Matthew tells us many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised and coming out of the graves after his resurrection. So there was some kind of a, a time gap here from the, you know, the, the graves being opened and the resurrected bodies actually appearing after Jesus had been raised from the dead on the third day. There's no doctrine built on this. Uh, there's no reference really made to it anywhere else in the Bible. And so there's no point in making something out of it. If the Bible doesn't make something out of it, neither should we. That's a good principle of interpretation, by the way. But it was obviously a very supernatural event. And uh, it just added to the, the wonder of those who saw all of this going on. Uh, one of the Romans, in this case, verse 54, the centurion, said, truly, this was the Son of God. Now, the centurion was a Roman a soldier in charge of 100 men. And it was probably, you know, his 100 men who were overseeing this crucifixion of Jesus. Truly, this was the Son of God, verse 54. And many women who followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, were there looking on from afar. Okay? So Jesus was on his own, but he wasn't on his own in the sense that even though the disciples had forsaken him and fled, a lot of the female disciples had not. Bless their hearts. You see, there's more to the disciples than the inner 12, okay, or the 12 as they were known. There was also the three, Peter, James, and John, who were the kind of the inner, inner uh, elite group. But there was also many others who followed as his disciples that are not mentioned by name. Some of the women are. But uh, in this case, you've got Mary Magdalene mentioned in verse 56. You've got Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons, James and John, the sons of Zebedee. Now evening had come. There came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. Um, Arimathea. It took me a while to discover where, where it is, because modern maps, of course, don't have it. But I did a little research and discovered that it was also known as Ramathayim Zufim. Uh, and you can read about that place in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 1, interestingly. But it was about 15 miles southwest of, uh, of Jerusalem. So it'd be pretty close to the coastal plain. Um, somewhere in the vicinity of uh, Tel Aviv and Haifa, removed from the coast by about five or seven miles. It's, it's, it's kind of vague. but. Arimathea was his place, and uh, Joseph of Arimathea was a part of the civil authority there, part of the Sanhedrin there, and he had become a follower of Jesus. We don't know how, and under what terms. We don't know if he'd heard Jesus preaching somewhere, or whether he'd seen some of Jesus' uh, miraculous healings, whether he himself had been healed. We don't know this, but we do know that he was rich. We do know that he was an elder. We do know that he had uh, carved out, or had carved out from the living rock, a tomb for himself which suggests that maybe he was getting up in years and was getting ready for his death. Um, none of those details are given to us, so we just have to you know, make some guesses. Um, but nevertheless, it was Jewish tradition to bury the dead on the day they died. It still is the case. Many, many times when I, my wife and I and our three kids were living in Jerusalem, uh, there'd be someone who would lose their life in Lebanon uh, through some kind of a uh, an encounter with Hezbollah up there, and uh, they would ship the body right back to Jerusalem and have them buried before the sun had set. Uh, it, it's just the way it's done in, uh, in Jewish uh, tradition. 
Um, the body's not put in a coffin, it's just wrapped, put in the ground. Uh, no real um, preparation for burial like we do, uh, most of us here in the West, but uh, that's, that's the way it was done. Now the body of a crucified or gibbeted uh, man who had died was not allowed to remain overnight, whether he was Jew or Gentile, okay? In this case, Jesus was Jewish, but he'd also died before sunset. And so Joseph of Arimathea, who was there, probably for Passover, he knew what was going on. He maybe had followed from afar, maybe as a member of the Arimathea Sanhedrin, he was, you know, good friends with some of the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem, we don't know. They probably didn't know that he was a believer, but he was. Anyway, he goes to Pilate, he asks for permission, Pilate gives permission. Now we see in other accounts that Nicodemus also was involved in this. He and Joseph of Arimathea took the body of Jesus down, ritually defiling themselves by touching a dead body, prepared him for burial, and buried him in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. Very, very impressive. JCT TV is the official voice of WOW, working for orphans and widows. Jim Cantillon is the founder of WOW and has been ministering to orphans and widows in distress for 18 years. WOW's focus is home-based care for the dying. The horizon is vast, with thousands of the least of these in Africa and India. WOW depends on your generous support. To do so, simply contact us by phone, mail, or online. Friends, when you call in or log on or whatever it is you do to support JCT and WOW, I'd be happy to send you Canon's casual commentary. Now, I've done it in four parts or tranches as I call them. Each of them will fit into a, um, an envelope, very easy to send to you. It's inexpensive. It's also convenient. Sit, you know, put it in a purse, put it in your pocket, tuck it in your Bible. Uh, and it's kind of between the lines commentary, casual commentary on, Ma on Matthew. That's Matthew. And within a few weeks, Mark will be coming your way as well. Remember your very best ministry gift when you ask for it. And let's keep in mind, friends, that we're not only concerned about proclaiming the gospel, we're also concerned about visiting orphans and widows in their distress. Together, we are a comprehensive ministry. How's that? Really appreciate you watching, really do. And look forward to the next time. Until then, bye for now.